Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today we're doing something slightly different. You see, uh, I, I have a few telescopes because I'm a bit of a space nerd, in case you hadn't noticed. And uh, just after Christmas, I uh, found this telescope in my local, um, well, CVS, which is a chain of drugstores in the US. Now, actually, the price tag on this is $20, which is astoundingly low for a telescope. However, this was the post-Christmas sale, so they had got everything 50% off. When I got to the checkout, it rang up with 75% off. So I got a complete telescope kit for $5. Now, as you can expect, this is not a high-end instrument. The first clue I'm going to say right away is that it talks about the magnification. It's a 60 times or 120 times re refractor. It does not mention the aperture at all. It does mention that it includes like a finder scope, a full-size adjustable tripod, interchangeable eyepieces to let, to let you get different uh, zooms. But I'm going to say to their credit, the only pictures they include of astronomical targets is the moon. And that's actually nice because there's a lot of cheap, cheap, cheap telescopes that will show you glorious pictures of the nebula, which you can't really take unless you have the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so yeah, let me just see, uh, we got mirrored diagonal eyepiece, which is very useful if you're looking at the sky. Screw type assembly, great for seeing stars, planets, and constellations. No mentions of nebula. Uh, yeah, let's just take this apart. This is Sakar International, also known as Vivitar, Edison, New Jersey. So yeah, let's uh, just pop this thing apart so we can see the high quality hardware that we can expect here. I'm gonna ditch the box. And, well, what have we got? We got our diagonal here, which is just a very lightweight piece of plastic with a mirror, 90 degree mirror in it. We have a manual, which is tells you to basically look at the internet. We have a finder scope, which has an absolutely minuscule field of view. In fact, I'm not even, I don't even think it's magnifying anything. But look at, look at the size of that thing. It's it is very, very cheap, very, very awful. I didn't actually use this when I was testing it. We have a pair of eyepieces, and we will take a look at these later. Obviously, these are different focal lengths to provide different levels of magnification. There is the full-size tripod made of the cheapest aluminium I have ever encountered. And if we slide this out just to get a quick idea of the size, um, it kind of comes up to my waist. So it's full size if you happen to be a child. I didn't use this because it was utterly awful. Thankfully, I do have some far better tripods to use, something far more sturdy. And finally, the telescope tube itself, packed in the finest of high-grade polystyrene. It's even broken a bit. And, oh, I'm feeling some really wonderful static electricity here. Or perhaps it's the excitement. Yes, telescope tube. It is actually a metal tube. It has a tripod mounting hole there, a screw. It has a focuser, which is kind of stiff, but it loosened up after I used it for a little while. The end piece here is 0.965 inches, right? Which is a an older eyepiece size. Most people use uh, 1.25 inch eyepieces. Uh, for some reason, all over the world, I see people referring to eyepiece sizes in inches when the focal lengths are measured in millimeters. And I think maybe that makes sense because the focal length is what you really care about. And yeah, down this end, we have a very small lens. It's, um, I measured it, it's 50 millimeters. So a 50 millimeter aperture, which is pretty tiny but you can go, do good science with a, you know, well, you can do good, you can look at good things with 50 millimeter eyepieces. But for many of my telescopes, I'm going to say I use finder scopes like this. This is a finder scope to help me point my regular scope. It's actually one I took off because it doesn't have a 90 degree uh, angle on it. Uh, but it, its aperture is, you know, 50 millimeters. So <laughs> this thing costs a lot more than that Vivitar telescope, even at full price. So yeah, not the highest quality construction, but can you have fun with it? Well, I, I did go out and take some pictures. The eyepieces, yeah, the eyepieces. Well, so these are just about the simplest eyepieces I ever encountered. I'm gonna show you here. I think if I put my finger in here, I can probably pull these apart. There we go. Take the insert out, 
Uh, where's the lens? Damn it. Oh, there we go. There is the single lens. So first thing you'll know is that eyepieces, well, good quality eyepieces, you'll have multiple lenses in them because eyepieces are important. What they do is they magnify what has been focused, brought down to the focal plane by the main objective lens or the main objective mirror. And so they actually make it easier for the eyes to discern any detail. Now, for comparison, I use um, I use these kind of lenses a lot. These are f twenty five millimeter plus all lenses. This is a nice big optical aperture there. Also, compare the diameter of the the two here, right? See the small one versus the big one. Twenty five millimeters, decent size. It lets you see fairly wide fields of view, depending upon what you're using, but most importantly, when you look through it, the field of view your eye sees is really nicely wide. It's not amazing. The other example of lenses I have are Kellner lenses, and I'll show you one of those later. They're kind of narrower, but this this is a single element lens. And not only that, I don't know if you noticed, the, pla the, the lens, it has a little thing on the end because this is a plastic lens and they just broke it off the sprue and stuck it in there. This is... Oh, absolutely terrible. This is uh, the 10 millimeter lens. Odd, oddly enough, I think the 20 millimeter lens they include maybe slightly. Yeah. Oh, this is a five millimeter lens. Okay. So this is a 25. There you go. And just for comparison, I have even more fantastic lenses. This is a, a planetary series Burgess TMB, Thomas M. Back, I think. Uh, and it is super wonderful and flat and gorgeous and sexy. And I, that this is this is what you want to look at the sky through. If you can't afford that, then you get one of these. You never, never use a plastic lens. So yeah, did it work? Yes, I did get pictures through it. I used one of these gizmos, which is lets you strap a cell phone onto a uh, onto over a lens and then image through the lens. I didn't try to put anything at prime focus because I didn't have a way to adapt. In fact, to adapt this uh, 965 millimeters, I had to use another diagonal that came with another telescope. And I'm just gonna bring it out because this is also something I got for Christmas. It's a little Celestron like backpack scope. It's a travel scope. It cost $50. So that's 10 times the price of the previous uh, device. And yeah, I'll just bring it out here. Look at that beautiful little, sweet little thing. Now this is not expensive, but the whole point of this was, I, I, I wanna just have it in the car and be able to bring it out or, or you know, go hiking around and see stuff. It is not particularly high quality, but it is good enough for what it is. The aperture is the same as on that one, right? Focal length is different and focal length is what defines your magnification, but aperture defines how much uh, light you're bringing in. And uh, yeah, this one, as I mentioned, this comes with a Kellner lens. The Kellner is a cheaper type of lens. It's not as cheap as these really cheap ones here. So uh, you'll get that on the cheap scopes if you, and you can get a nice upgrade if you just buy like one of these and stick it in there, it'll just work fine. Uh, so, you know, if I, if I was to spend, say, $100 on a cheap telescope for an amateur person, I would get the 70 millimeter version of this and then spend 20 bucks on one of these. Uh, and then the great thing is that although the telescope is small and doesn't provide huge amounts of light, it isn't something that they will necessarily grow out of right away because when you get a bigger scope, great, you've still got a backpack scope and you can take it around. You don't need to get rid of it. Whereas if you buy something like this Vivitar, this is this is junk. It's gonna go in the trash as soon as you start doing anything interesting with it. And this also comes with a marginally better tripod, a backpack, you know, charts, software, all the things a growing astronomer needs. But it does happen to have a 0.965 adapter on the end here, right? This is the except accepts that size of eyepiece. But the diagonal is large enough to take the, the 125 uh, inch lenses or eyepieces. Other important thing, by the way, to mention is the with the eyepieces, what they're doing is they're, they're amplifying, they're magnifying the focal plane. The magnification of a telescope depends upon the focal length of the telescope divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. So this uh, telescope has a focal length of 360. 
this eyepiece has an app sorry i've said one of these eyepieces has a an app, um a focal length of 10 millimeters that would be 36 times magnification whereas if you put that 10 millimeter lens on this you would get this is a 600 millimeter focal length 10 millimeter lens you get 60 times magnification that's why the the two lenses that come with it are 10 millimeter and 5 millimeter this one comes with a 20 millimeter lens generally good telescopes come with lower magnification uh, or longer focal length eyepieces to start with because magnification is it's a nice number to put on the box but it's actually pretty lousy anyway anyway while we're here let's just move this out the way i just want to pause for a second and show you my actual refractor that i use and have been using for a long time this is also a 600 millimeter focal length scope like the vivitar it is a an Orion, it has an aperture of 100 millimeters, so it's got twice the aperture, four times the light gathering capability, but it is built a lot tougher. More importantly, it came with a mount, which is the kind of thing you would put field artillery on. It will hold the thing steady. And all in all, I paid about $500 for it, although most of that money was in the mount. So yeah, we've got the $5, the $50, the $500 scope. And you know what? If you want to go crazy and go like to a stellar view, you could easily spend $5,000 on a refractor roughly this size. Uh, notice also the 50 millimeter finding scope, like same aperture here. Nice high quality hardware all the down. And this will actually take two inch eyepieces for people that really want to get you know big, low, long focal lengths. So that's a quick aside there. Put that out there. Now, one of the things with refractors is that the optics will naturally cause the light to disperse. That means the red and the blue, because they are being refracted, they refract by different amounts and you will get something called a chromatic aberration. That means the red stuff, the red light will, you'll either get blue or red fringing depending upon uh, how your thing is set up. These telescopes, the, the Orion and the Celestron, they use something called an achromatic doublet, right? And if I this is a this is an eyepiece sorry this is not an eyepiece this is an objective lens from a telescope i found in the trash yes i'm not above stealing telescopes from people's trash they thought it was garbage but uh, it was marginally better than the vivitar and i'm just going to try to take off this retaining screw here here we go and in here you can see an example of an achromatic doublet you've got two lenses here and a separator one is convex and the other is con is partially concave and they fit together very neatly and you'll put the spacer in there and that will make sure that the light isn't terribly um, aberrated. <laughs> that means that you don't get these awful blue red fringing. If you're spending a lot of money in a refractor you can get multi three or four element lenses. They use a type of glass that uh, contains fluorite and fluorite is a highly dispersive um, material which means that they can actually remove all the chromatic aberration and they're called aprochromats. I'm going to take the lens off of this just to take a look. So yeah I did take these telescopes out to test them all and yeah the moon you know we get nice pictures of the moon but obviously I think the telescope images from the $50 telescope were vastly superior. Uh, Whereas this one, I could barely get it to sit within the field of view. Okay, there we go. Oh, and it does have some baffling in there. So that's good. I was thinking that there was no baffling at all. Baffling is important because it stops internal reflections, which can ruin the light. And I'm looking at this, and I can see right away that this is a single piece of glass in here. I don't think these lenses, they're not coated. So coated lenses will include a special coating that reduces reflections. Very important, you know, if you ever see a lens with a kind of purple sheen to it, that's a coated lens. This is just a piece of glass. I'm not sure there's anything on this. Yeah, uh, I don't see, <laughs> I'm not sure I can take this off. It looks like it might be glued in there rather than screwed in there. I'm not gonna try because I might ruin my $5 telescope. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, you can take a look at the pictures I took, and I basically ended up taking pictures of the moon, and you can see some detail on it. You can take a look through it, and yes, you can see details on the moon. 
In many ways, this is superior to the telescope that Galileo himself used, and he was a bit of an innovator. So you can pick out the moons of Jupiter, you can pick out the, the moons, you can pick out craters on the moon. You can get a hint of the Orion Nebula. So it's not completely hopeless. You can see, um, you know, Sirius, uh, not Sirius, the, the, the Pleiades. But please don't buy this unless this is the only thing you can afford. In which case, sure, but just appreciate that you're going to grow out of it very, very quickly. Uh, or you're going to, you don't, what you want to avoid doing is buying something that's so junky, it will ruin any nascent interest in observational astronomy. You want to have something that's at least halfway useful. That's, that's why I like this, right? This is like a your small telescope that can go anywhere. And when you grow up, you know, you can start by swapping out the lens or the eyepiece. You can get a better tripod. You can then at some point buy a better tube. You know, it's, it's a base for something. And even when you've grown out of it, you still have this portable scope. So I think this is kind of cute. I like it. I don't like that because I'm never going to use that again. And obviously, if you, you're like me, you're going to end up with these giant 12-inch Dobson telescopes. When I say 12-inch, that isn't the length of it. That is the size of the mirror on that beast out there. It looks like a water tank. In fact, I've had people comment that that's a strange place to put a water tank. Little do they know opening themselves up to, you know, very long conversations about astronomy because I'm a bit of a nerd. Yeah, $5 telescope does in fact work, but please don't buy it. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe. <laughs>